A little later than published, Patrick Moore crosses the Irish Sea to take a fresh perspective on the sky at night. This is an interesting time for astronomy. It's the centenary of the British Astronomical Association, founded in 1890, and still the major astronomical observing society in the world. I've belonged to it myself now for well over 50 years. But this is also the bicentenary of the Armad Observatory in Northern Ireland, founded in 1790. Armad Observatory is a picturesque place. There are lovely buildings, and there are two telescope domes. This is the dome of the Robinson 10-inch refractor, which I've used myself on many occasions. In fact, I made a drawing of the planet Saturn with it the other night. And the picture of the Arend Roland comet, the first picture ever to be shown on the Sky at Night program in 1957, was taken with this Schmidt telescope. But today, Armagh is no longer a major observational centre, but it is the centre for very important astronomical investigations. The observatory had a long and sometimes rather checkered history. The reason Armagh was chosen was because we had an archbishop here who was a great benefactor of the city. He wanted to uh, establish a university here and he thought the uh, observatory would fit in very well. Some of the past directors have been colourful characters, haven't they? They certainly have been. Um, I think, for instance, of uh, Thomas Romney Robinson, the third director, who even had the railway uh, removed or, or put uh, a few hundred yards back because it was too close to his sensitive instruments and uh, their vibrations would have disturbed him. Well, of course, he was a great observer and he made use of this Troughton Equatorial Telescope. He did. It was the first instrument that was delivered at the observatory in 1795 and uh, he used it together with other instruments to produce uh, the Armagh catalogue, which came out in 1859 and which was a good contribution to determining the positions very accurately of the stars. There was a transit and there was a mural circle. Instruments which only move in the meridian. They can only look north, south and overhead. And the moment the star passes through the telescope gives you exactly the position of the star in the sky. Then, after Robinson, the Danish astronomer, J. L. E. Dreyer, who drew up the famous catalogue of clusters and nebulae. Yes, he had been working as an assistant at Burr in County Offaly. It was the largest telescope in the world at that time. And uh, with his experience, he put together a catalogue of star clusters and nebulae, which uh, has lasted until today. Astronomers use it widely every day. And in a field like astronomy, where everything ch changes so fast, to produce a work that lasts for more than 100 years is really phenomenal. Then Eric Lindsay really modernised the observatory. He came just before the Second World War. The observatory had fallen into some disrepair, uh, but he started moving the wheels, including those of government. He, he got uh, proper funding established, and uh, after the Second World War, when all the situations were normalized, the observatory really began to be built up and expand uh, into a modern astrophysical research institute. Though no actual professional observation is now carried out from Armagh, is it fair to say that the observatory is still a major centre of technical investigations? It is. And uh, we have not abandoned our observations altogether because we use observatories in other parts of the world to carry those out and then bring back the data to do our astrophysical research in this place. What's your own particular line of research at the moment? Well, my particular interest is focused on a star in the constellation of the Swan called P. Cygni. It's a very unusual star. It is a star which is among the very brightest in our Milky Way. And it was discovered in the year 1600 by a Dutch astronomer by the name of Blau. It was just at the time when the telescope was invented. And so, before the star was fading from view, telescopes picked it up and have followed it ever since. What kind of a star is it? It is highly luminous, and it lives dangerously, shall we say, uh, on the edge of instability. It does not quite know whether it should hold together by gravity or whether it should blow apart under the influence of the radiation pressure of all that energy that is produced in its inside and blow apart. As a result, uh, it has an enormous stellar wind. Its atmosphere is constantly bla being blown off the star, and sometimes uh, that's a constant process that goes on all the time. In between, there are shells, blobs of matter, that are thrown off the star at irregular intervals. 
the thing is, we know there is this stellar wind, we know where there are these shells from time to time, but we don't know exactly how the star throws them off. And this is what uh, the observations should be telling us if we can unravel them completely. P Cygni appears as a point of light, either to the naked eye or in a telescope. So how do you carry out your investigations into it? The observations are done by photometry, which is measuring the light that comes from the star, and by spectroscopy, which is looking at its spectrum. Uh, every spectrum has a number of signatures which are contributed by the main elements. And we see that, for instance, the hydrogen and helium are uh, elements that are very abundant in the atmosphere of P. Cygni. There are also very interesting lines of iron, and they tell us exactly what is happening in the atmosphere. If P. Cygni is losing mass at a high rate, it can't last for nearly so long as an ordinary star such as the Sun. No, uh, a star like P. Cygni in this state of its uh, evolution will not last longer than maybe a couple of 10,000 years at most. What will happen to it then? Well, that's another thing that we are not too very sure about. It could develop into a Wolverine star, which are very, very special stars again. Uh, the possibility is not uh, too remote that in the, in the somewhat longer term, it could blow up as a supernova. I know there's a very intense program of observations of it, and you're at the center of this. Yes, many observations are being done of P. Cygni in various places all around the world, and um, many of the data come to my desk where I analyzed them in collaboration with colleagues in Heidelberg and Utrecht. How did you first become interested in P. Cygni particularly? It was suggested to me as a thesis subject by my professor uh, back in 1963. Um, she knew very well it was a very intricate star with, with a very difficult thing to, to analyze properly. And uh, the fact that I've been at it for about uh, nearly 30 years uh, without uh, cracking the whole thing completely, I think shows you that it was a difficult subject, but a very interesting one that has captivated me ever since. It would be absurd to suggest that the Armagh climate is suitable for actual observation. It isn't. There's far too much cloud and rain. But Armagh observers can always go abroad when they want to use major telescopes, and important solar observations are being carried out by Dr. Jerry Doyle. What particular research are you carrying out with respect to the sun? Uh, it's mostly the study of solar flares, although in the past I've also been looking at sunspots and active regions, but at the moment it's mostly solar flares. Solar flares are, are an extremely energetic phenomena. Typically, a solar flare may be many uh, more than magnitude greater than that of a hydrogen bomb, but not only does it release m large amount of radiation, but of course it ejects a large amount of material from the sun. This material can then inter interact with the Earth's atmosphere a few days later, causing power blackouts. I know you've just come back from La Palma in the Canary Islands. What exactly were you doing there? Well, flares not only occur in the sun and late-type stars, but they also occur in many other stars. In particular, they occur in uh, subgiant stars. The star I was looking at there was called I.I. Pegasus, and in La Palma I had two telescopes, the INT plus the one-meter telescope. We were looking up to observe two nice flares on, on I.I. Pegasus. The energy in these flares were several hours much greater than either that of DME flare or a solar flare. I've worked with the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in, in Hawaii, um, just recently got an observing shift there. There I was looking at M dwarf stars. Now what makes this particular interesting, this region particularly interesting, is that a few years ago a colleague and I, John Butler here at the observatory, presented some observational evidence that seems to, seem to suggest that the hot, the hot outer atmosphere of these stars, that is the region called the corona, is heated through a flare-like process. If that is the case, then these flares will uh, generate a large population of extremely energetic electrons. These electrons will then lose their energy through a process known as synchrotron radiation, and one of the best places to look for that is the millimetre wave region, hence the use of James Clark Maxwell. Now, if you look at this particular graph here, what we have here is flux versus wavelength or frequency. In the bottom left-hand corner, you have the optical observations you get from ground-based telescopes. Then you have infrared data, followed by data we obtained from uh, an infrared satellite. Then there's a large gap when you come up to the radio data, which I would tune from the uh, very large radio telescope, radio telescope in the USA. But this gap was really unobserved up until a few weeks ago, in which we got one point which filled up this very important gap. Now, I must go out there in a few weeks' time to uh, observe more stars, because I only observed two stars last time, and it's very dangerous to draw any firm conclusions based on only two stars. Jerry, thank you very much. Most stars shine steadily over very long periods, but there are some which don't. Those are the variable stars. 
Now, ordinary variable stars are different from the flare stars we mentioned just now, most of which are small and red, and which brighten up very suddenly over a minute or two, and then take hours to die down to their normal brightness. Dr. Brendan Byrne, the assistant director of our Mar Observatory, has been making a special study of, of these curious objects. These stars on which we see the, the flare events, the flare stars, are quite different from the sun. They are smaller, they are less massive, they are cooler. Surface temperatures on a flare star may be only half that on the sun, about 3,000 degrees. Um, the radius of a typical flare star would only be about half that of the, of the sun. Um, now, the spots which occur on these flare stars are similarly much larger than we see in the case of the sun. It's very rare that, in fact, we see clearly a naked eye spot on the surface of the sun, simply because the fraction of the sun's surface covered by a typical sunspot is indeed very small, a thousandth or less of the solar surface. In the case of these flare stars, we see spots which cover up to 50% of the visible hemisphere of the star. A star appears only as a point of light. So how do you go about studying these flare stars? One of the things we've discovered as a result of our investigations is that it is the most rapidly rotating stars which give the greatest numbers of flares and the flares with most energy, and similarly the largest spots. In fact, this effect is related to the dynamo effect. These stars, in fact, are giant dynamos. So the more rapidly the ro they rotate, just as if you cycle faster on a bicycle, you get a brighter light, so too you get more magnetic effects, more flares, more spots. Uh, now, if we monitor a star which is a large spot over a period of time and look at its light level, and of course, when these giant spots are in view, the amount of light we get from the, the star is depressed. Uh, if we wait a little while as the star rotates, the, the spot will be carried across the surface of the star and disappear around the limb onto the opposite hemisphere. Then, of course, the, we see the unspotted surface of the star, and so the brightness of the star increases back to its previous unspotted level. And then if we wait a little while, the spot will reoccur, and so we see a periodic effect due to the appearance and disappearance of these spots. Yes, but from the appearance and behaviour of these stars, how do you know that star spots are responsible? The unique thing about the spotted stars is that while they have this constancy over several rotations, nevertheless the spots grow and decay with time and even rearrange themselves on the surface of the star. So the details of the light curve will change with time. What about changes in the spectra? That must tell you a great deal about these flare stars. First of all, these stars are very rapidly rotating, so they have a large velocity difference between the edges of the star and the center of the star. If we concentrate on a spectral line, which is formed differently in the spot from the unspotted star, then, of course, when we see the spot on the approaching limb of the star, that is when it's just popping into view, we will find that the spectral line becomes distorted because we have a large section of the of the uh, surface of the star on the approaching limb, therefore on the blue shifted side of the, of the line profile, which behaves very differently from the rest of the star. And we see this notch on the spectral line. And this will move with time as the spot proceeds across the surface of the star. So we can actually follow the spot's progress across the surface of the star by looking at its signature in an individual spectral line. We've been talking about spotted stars and flare stars. Are they the same thing? We always believed that these gi giant spotted stars were different in nature from the classical flare stars. Flares did occur indeed on them, but we never saw them in the optical spectrum. They never seemed, the flare mechanism seemed to be different. But in fact, last year we discovered that in fact, optical flares do indeed occur on these stars. And they are more energetic again, by at least a factor of 100 to 1,000 than the flare stars. So we have here flares, truly giant flares, newly discovered, in the optical, uh, and which um, may be exceed those of the sun by a factor of a million in energy. Now for a rather tricky question. Where do these stars fit into the evolutionary pattern? I was afraid you might ask that question, Patrick. There is no clear consensus as to how the flare stars fit into the evolutionary sequence. The simplest idea is, in fact, that they are very young and uh, that they have preserved their primordial spin because as the hydrogen cloud collapses to form a newborn star, angular momentum is conserved just as a skater pulls in their arms and so spins up. So the hydrogen cloud would in fact spin up as it forms the star, and so a young star is expected to be rapidly rotating. The simplest idea is that the flare stars are young. This is not borne out when we examine the case in detail because we find many of the flare stars, when we measure their galactic motions, may in fact be old. 
you know, of course, that Proxima Centauri, the very closest star to the Sun and a companion to the Sun's twin, Alpha Centauri, is in fact a flare star. And it is at least as old as the Sun. So how do we explain then the, the activity in terms of youth? Um, the, there is a second idea, and that is that there is a, a, a very fundamental link between rapid rotation and this activity. And it is the activity which preserves the rapid rotation. Because we believe that in the early stages of the sun's evolution, mass loss through a very much strengthened solar wind was an important means of slowing the sun down to its present relatively slow rotation. However, if a star is very active, it has many closed magnetic fields. And so matter is not s able to escape in a solar wind quite so easily. So it may well be that the activity has actually preserved the rapid rotation, not alone depending on it, but actually preserving it. How do you go about observing these flare stars? Do you physically look at them? We don't, in fact, look at the stars anymore. In fact, we uh, these days record the light of the star with computer-controlled equipment, computer-controlled light monitoring equipment. We use spectra. Uh, we use uh, any satellite we can get our hands on, X-ray satellites, uh, we used the Japanese X-ray satellite to observe this flare on IAPEG, the Aura-CVN star, last year. We used IUE, the International Ultraviolet Explorer satellite. And indeed, we look forward later on this year, or early next year, to using the newly launched ROSAT satellite to observe flares for the first time in the far ultraviolet regions of the spectrum. What we come back with from a, an observing campaign is, in fact, of course, a whole lot of computer mag tapes. These cannot be analyzed without access to a good computer system. And here at Armagh, we have uh, a Starlink computer. Now, perhaps I should say a little bit about what Starlink is. Starlink is a dedicated UK network of computers whose sole purpose is to make astronomical uh, computations. Not only with the UK, but in recent years, we've developed our links with the international community. And uh, since this um, activity is of its very nature an international activity, uh, we need to keep in constant close contact with our colleagues in the United States, in uh, continental Europe, in Australia and South Africa, and indeed more recently in the USSR. And we can do that very easily by exchanging data via these com very important computer links. We can now directly compare data. So you can see that despite the climate and despite the lack of large telescopes, there's a great deal of important work going on at Armagh. We have the lovely old observatory itself as headquarters, and it's a modern research establishment in every sense of the word. We also have the Associated Planetarium, of which I had the honour to be the first director nearly a quarter of a century ago, and is now as up-to-date as any in the world. Billowing cloud of black dust that astronomers predict may grow like this. Well, this was the period before the universe began, and we know nothing about it. Then... When you remember that Armagh isn't a large city, I think you'd agree that Northern Ireland has every reason to be satisfied. Armagh Observatory is just 200 years old. I'm quite sure that the next 200 years will be just as fruitful as those of the past. Our latest newsletter is now available, and if you want it, please send your stamp to envelope to Newsletter number 39, The Sky at Night, BBC...